dear friends and net aspirants welcome back to our channel and this is Lizzy Maria and in this video we will be learning about Wimsat and Beardsley as uh, important new critics and their concepts their key uh, text and uh, some facts related to them so uh, if you have not yet subscribed to my youtube channel subscribe to me if you are listening to me for the first time and if you are interested to have more detailed uh, study materials for NTA, UGC, Net, JRF, English Language and Literature. For the same, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram ID is Ligimaria90. There, there also you will find many variety of materials in my feed, in my story and in my real session as well. And if you need a more systematically arranged, simplified and comprehensible and also affordable study materials in the form of 900 plus audio lectures and downloadable PDF materials and the previous and practice question papers which are lively attemptable in the website you can visit my website www.highpoint.in 15 percentage of off is going on in the fee structure and also uh, you can find many facilities there after the free trial you can see whatever we are providing and if you are interested to have the courses and be a student of our family then you can subscribe to the course from the website itself and if you want to know more about the courses bonuses or anything else free bonuses then you can whatsapp me or call me in this number or via instagram id to via instagram page too you can reach out to me okay moving on let's have an introduction uh, section about Wimsat and Beardsley so these are the person that I was referring Wimsat and Beardsley they always come together jointly they have uh, came up with many concepts and texts which are relevant in new criticism so the full name of Wimsat is William Kurtz Wimsat lived from 19 uh, not 7 to 19 75 and Monroe Beardsley lived from 1915 to 1985. That was their lifespan. So let's move on to their introduction about uh, Wimsat and Beardsley. They have produced two influential and controversial papers in New Criticism. So they are known for these two influential and very pivotal and controversial papers in papers in New Criticism. They are the Intentional Fallacy published in 1946 and the Effective Fallacy published in 1949. So these are the two papers that they have published and they became so influential and controversial papers in New Criticism. Let's have the first essay titled as The Intentional Fallacy. They refuse to accept the notion of design or intention as a standard of literary critical interpretation. So what they are saying, so whenever you are doing a literary critical interpretation or literary criticism or analysis or any study related to a poem or a work, then you should not go for you should not take the intention of the author in order to write that work as a standard as a basis for this critical appreciation this critical interpretation or study and they are so that intention searching for intention finding out intention of the author inside a work that is that in that uh, way of criticism was refused by whom uh, by Beardsley and Wimsatt in this essay, The Intentional Fallacy, they raise the question how a critic might find out what a poet's intention was. So, if ever you are trying to find out the intention of the poet, intention of the right, how come a critic will find out that? How come you are going to, suppose you are a reader or a critic, then how come you are going to find out the poet's intention? It's nearly impossible because you are trying to, you know, find out the meaning according to your own you know your own understanding of the poem not uh, you know you cannot find out the intention of the author from the poem poet but you if you want to know the intention of the poet then you go, you have to go out of the poem and search for it if the poet succeeded in doing it see if the poet succeeded in finding out the intention of the poet then the poem itself shows what he was trying to do see you as a reader or a critic you succeeded in doing uh, or finding out the intention of the poet suppose that happened then the poem itself was about what he was trying to do what the poet was trying to say that is that's the poem all about right and if the poet did not succeed suppose you find out the intention of the poet in order to write this poem but you feel that the poet is not uh, succeeded or poet did not succeed in this in this venture of 
expressing his intention in this poetry then what happens then the poem is not an adequate evidence and the critic must go outside the poem for evidence of the intention that did not become effective in the poem in order to find out the intention of the poet you have to go out of the poem see by reading the poem itself you uh, find out the intention of the poet suppose that happened but still in order to know whether this intention is correctly used or correctly came up or came out in this poem in this poem by written by a poet for that you have to go out of the poem and you have to search for the intention of the poet so in either of the cases this is not how a poem should be valued should be criticized or interpreted or studied okay so the intention according to the intention of the poet and how far this intention is fulfilled inside the poem that is not the basis of studying interpreting or analyzing a poetry that's what they are mainly saying the intentional fallacy if you are doing if you are taking the intention of the poet and how far this intention is fulfilled established in the poetry if that is the basis of your criticism then you are making a fallacy you are making a mistake in interpreting in criticizing and analyzing the poem so that's what they some total say in this essay the poem should not mean but be this is a quote uh, a statement made by an american poet known as archibald maclish a poem can be only through its meaning since its medium is words yet it is simply is in the sense that we have no excuse for inquiring what part is intended or meant in this respect poetry differs from practical messages which are successful if and only if we correctly infer the intention so what they are saying archibald maclish he made the statement the poem should not mean but be so a poem should not uh, some a poem is not something that is uh, saying something else through that medium but it is the say it, it it is the poem is a poem that itself is the message it should not mean something else but it should be what that meaning okay so a poem can only be through its meaning so a poem can exist only through its meaning since its medium is words yet it is simply is in the sense that we have no excuse for inquiring what part is intended or meant so what happens you know there is in a poem there is a meaning but you know you should not go for the intention and divide the poem into different parts in order to find out the intention and meaning of the uh, meaning of the poem it should be considered as a whole thing in this respect poetry differs from practical messages which are successful if and only if we correctly infer the intention see you cannot find out the intention see everything whatever we are saying there is an intention behind it uh, i am recording this video there is an intention about it and if you are saying something there, there is an intention so every other utterance every other statements everything whatever we are making there is an intention but in poetry it differs from practical messages that we usually use in our day to day, day to day life so in practical messages it is successful if only if we correctly infer the intention if we correctly expose our intention only then or if we have a correct intention only then that practical message is message is successful otherwise it is not successful right but in poetry it differs because we cannot take the intention of the author as a basis for the criticism as the basis for the critical uh, interpretation that we are doing poem is an autonomous verbal structure which has which has its end in itself which has no purpose beyond its own existence as an aesthetic object here the two critics vincent and beers they say that poem it's an autonomous it's uh, you know it's an autonomous existence verbal structure which has its own existence it has no other purpose other than being an aesthetic object it has its own end which is aesthetic it has no purpose uh, in order to look for the intention of the poet but it has an aesthetic existence 
it is not answerable to criteria of truth accuracy or representation or imitation or morality you should not look for a criteria for truth accuracy of representation imitation or morality in poetry so we can have many contending um, ideas that goes against the statement but still this is what beardsley and winsett are saying in their essay that a poem has its own end which is uh, which has an aesthetic existence and it is not answerable it is not obliged to give any answers to the criteria of truth or the accuracy and correctness of representation whatever that we have in there and the imitation or morality if it goes against the moral rules then that is the way that poem is constructed there ends it and it is not answerable to any of the moral codes that is there outside the poem the thoughts and attitudes of a poem can be imputed only to the dramatic speaker or person of the poem not directly to the author so in every other poem there will be a uh, an exposed or inexposed uh, speaker we usually take speaker synonymous to the author if there is no um, distinction so if distinctively there is a speaker then we will refer to that speaker if not most probably we will take synonymous uh we will take the speaker of the poem as the author so that should not be done the thoughts and attitudes of the speaker revealing in the uh, revealing inside a poetry that is not directly connected to the author that is not uh, the same attitude and thoughts that should not attribute to the author but it is the dramatic speaker speaking in the poem a poem published no longer belongs to the author but to the public for interpretation that it is embodied in language so the poem is embodied in language it is a linguistic structure verbal structure that it has so it is there it is uh, existing in linguistic structure that is there so when the poem is published it no longer belongs to the author particular author and the author or the speaker especially the speaker that is there in the poem he or she is not directly connected to the author that means he is not synonymous to the author but it is an entirely dramatic speaker that we have to see inside that poem and it goes against longinus here the intentional fallacy this theories of beardsley and wimsett that goes against uh, longinus goethe when they say poem echoes the soul of the author longinus in on the sublime he says that the poem echoes the soul of the author and goethe more or less says the same so here beardsley and wimsett they go against longinus and goethe now so that was intentional fallacy then what we have now the second essay by them is the affective fallacy let's see some tenets and some points that they discuss in this essay nothing outside the poem matters in interpreting it here they what they are saying some people they are saying that just like you should not take intention of the author as a basis for your analysis or interpretation of the poetry just like that the effectiveness of the poem upon a reader or a critic the impact made by a poem upon a reader or critic that should not that also should not be taken as a standard or a basis for your critical analysis of a poem so the effectiveness or the impact of the poem made upon the reader that is not inside the poem that is an information that we can have outside the poem so whatever that is outside the poem nothing outside the poem anything that is there outside the poem matters in interpreting it nothing outside the poem matters in interpreting it so effectiveness affective uh, effectiveness of a poem upon a for a reader or the impact made by a poem upon a reader is something that stands outside the uh, poem and that is not needed to taken as a basis for interpreting a poem this fallacy occurs when we attempt to exculpate attempt to explicate or interpret a poem through a recourse to the emotions or mental state produced in the readers or hearers so when you read a poetry what kind of emotion and mental state produced inside a reader or critic after reading it so that affectiveness that impact that emotional status that was brought about by reading this poem that should not be taken as a 
basis for interpreting a work. That is also a fallacy if you are taking it. As intentional fallacy is the confusion between the poem and its origin, the effective fallacy is the confusion between the poem and its result. So, intentional fallacy is a fallacy that will occur when we have a confusion, when we are taking poem and connecting the poem with its origin, that means poem and its intention of the poet. An effective fallacy is a confusion, it's a situation, it's a, it's a fault thing happens when we connect between the poem and its end results which happened inside a reader. Taking the reader's response as a criterion in interpretation criterion of interpretation is that it makes criticism more subjective rather than objective activity. So, a criticism of the poem, a poem should be an objective activity. So, when you take the affective side of a poetry or the emotional response or emotions uh, reproduced, emotions produced inside a reader as a criterion, as a basis and standard of interpretation, then that is a fallacy that criticism will be more subjective rather than objective. And the affective fallacy rejects the attempts of I. Richards and Charles L. Stevenson to separate emotive from referential meaning. So, when uh, Beardsley and Wim said, when they say that you should not take emotion produced inside a reader as a criteria for interpreting poetry, but he is there, but they are not separating emotive from, from referential meaning. So, either emotional meaning as well as the referential meaning, they are the same. You should not separate. So, here Beardsley and Wimsat, they reject when I. Richards and Stevenson, they try to separate emotive from referential meaning. Because there is no evidence that what a word does to a person is to be ascribed to anything except what it means or it suggests. So, why they uh, rejected uh, the, uh, the separation between emoting and referential meaning because there is no evidence that a word does to a person is to be ascribed to anything except what it means or it suggests. So, a word has a general meaning. You cannot say as a critic or reader or even the writer of the poem, they cannot say that a particular uh, word, what kind of meaning that this word can produce inside a reader's work. And there is no evidence for that. So, what kind of meaning this word is ascribing? And that means, immense meanings can happen. But there is a general uh, meaning. So, if the reader is getting any meaning other than that general meaning, there is no evident, evidence for that. So, there is no need that they separate. The meaning need to be separated as emotive and referential. It is, it is uh, infused and it should be not be separated according to Inside and BRC. But I. R. Richards and Stevenson, they uh, said that uh, emotive and referential meaning, they are separate. So, that was about uh, the major concepts by Beardsley and Winsett. Try to remember their most important essays, the effective, the intentional fallacy and the affective fallacy understand the major concepts and if you want to know more about them their concepts and uh, know more about many other literary theories and criticisms and others that need, you need to cover for your NTA UGC net JR of English language and literature you can visit my website and have the free trial and see whatever we have provided there to know more about anything related to our website and NTA UGC net JR of English language and literature you can whatsapp me for me in this number or via Instagram too. You can reach out to me and don't forget to follow me on Instagram as well as subscribe to my YouTube channel and while you subscribe press the bell icon so that you get a notification whenever we publish a video in here. So, meet you in the next video session. Until then, stay tuned to Hypoin and be happy wherever you are guys. Ta-ta. Thank you.